Amen. So we're making our way uh, through the book of 1 Timothy, and we're in 1 Timothy 5 tonight. And uh, just getting right into it, you know, it starts out there in verse 1 where it reads, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren. And if you recall, we talked about a little bit in previous chapters of how, how the fact that elder in the Bible refers to, can refer to, either a bishop or a pastor. But here we see that it also can refer to uh, somebody who is just an older, an older man, somebody who is uh, more aged than another, an elder uh, individual. So some folks will take that and try to twist it and say, well, an el see, an elder just means that. Well, no, actually it means both. That's what you get out of that. Uh, you know, a word can mean two different things. Um, there's not this, we don't have to have this strange idea that it either means this or that. It's a, you know, that false paradigm that people want to put out there. And a lot of times that's coming from people who just want, uh, you know, the pastor can just be anybody that, you know, they just want to ordain. You get that kind of an argument from people who like to self-ordain. You get that in the house church movement. But uh, what it's showing us here is that uh, an elder is just referring to an older man. And if you would, turn over to 1 Peter chapter 5. Of course, keep something there in 1 Timothy 5, but go to 1 Peter 5 because that gives us another great example where this word elder is used as an example of each. Uh, if you're there in 1 Timothy 5, look at verse 1 where the Bible reads, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder. So Peter here isn't saying, well, don't, you know, the, the old guys that are around you, uh, you know, which are among you, I exhort, because I'm also old. That's not what he's saying here. He, what he's saying, uh, he goes on and says, And a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God. Now, whose job is that? That's the job of the pastor. That's right. the, the job of the, the bishop or the elder. So that's the kind of elder that he's referring to there, is the fact that it's, you see again how an elder can refer to a pastor whose job it is to feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Then go ahead and jump down there to... Verse 5, where it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. So 1 Peter chapter 5 is just a great place where we can turn to to see that elder can be used in either context. You can use that either way to refer to either an elder, uh, someone who is older or refer to somebody who has uh, been given the oversight of the flock, a pastor. So really, you know, the, the main point here is not that. The main point in this chapter, of course, in these beginning verses is that uh, is dealing with the attitude we ought to have towards uh, these people that it's mentioning. Our attitude is what's addressed in verses 1 and 2. It says there, rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father. You know, that's, that should be the kind of attitude that we have towards somebody who is older. Uh, the younger men as brethren. You know, we should, we should treat them as, as brethren. The, young, uh, the elder women as mothers. Uh, the younger sisters as, well, with all purity. So we're to entreat elders as fathers, right? And really what that's showing us is that we should learn from those that have more experience. I mean, that's really what it's coming down to. And there's something to be said for the fact that life is, I don't want to say experience is the greatest teacher, because we know that the Holy Spirit and God's Word is the greatest teacher, but there is some truth to that idiom or that, to that saying that experience is a great teacher. You know, life, experience, life uh, you know, is something that you can only learn through experience. There are certain things in life that you're only going to understand and know about as you, as you grow older and, and go through certain things. So that's part of the reason why we should entreat elders as fathers. Somebody who's much older than <coughs> us is probably somebody that we should have a little bit more reverence for, a little bit more respect for, because of the fact they probably know some things that we don't. Right. And there's, those are, you know, that's something, this attitude is really lacking today. And, you know, uh, people come into the, uh, you know, thinking that they, they've got it all figured out, you know, but, you know, after a while they start to figure out that they don't. Right. I remember when I hit about 25, I, felt, I felt like I needed to start saying I'm 25 and a half. You know, sorry, you know when your little kids like to add the half on, you know, because it makes them feel a little older. I got to 25 and I realized I really don't have this all figured out. I'm really not uh, as smart as I think I am. And, and I, I kind of started feeling uh, my youth and I said, well, I'm 25 and a half, you know. Now, of course, I'm kidding. I didn't go around saying that, but that, that's what I felt like doing, like uh, I almost needed to. But, uh, and that in itself is a watershed moment in a person's life. Uh, some people, hopefully, they figure that out sooner than, than I did at 25. You know, um, they learn that very early on in life, hopefully, that we should be entreating our elders and, and going to them as fathers. Now, how would you entreat an elder as a father? Well, a father is somebody that you should be going to for advice. You know, if there's something that you need help with or something that you need advice in some area, that's who you should be entreating. People who have gone before you and gone through these things, who have experienced these things in life, that we should be entreating them as a father. So we should be learning from those. And, uh, you know, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 19, you have to turn there, it says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head 
and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the, I am the Lord. So you see that God puts an emphasis on this. He, 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 this is something that he brings up you know, in his word more than once. Uh, we see it in Leviticus and we see it again in first, or, uh, first Timothy. And go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16 where it's brought up again. And really, at the very least, we should be respectful. I mean, if we're going to treat somebody as our father, what that's telling us is that we should be respectful of those. We should respect these people, our elders. Uh, I think that's really what the main thrust is there, that we should be respectful of our elders, you know, regardless of what they can or can't teach us. Because he, the fact is, you know, just because you're older doesn't mean automatically make you wiser. Uh, that's not, there's no guarantee that you're going to be a wise person. Look there in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 31. Uh, the, it says there in Proverbs 16, verse 31, the hoary head is a crown of glory if, there's an if attached here, it be found in the way of righteousness. So it's not just, well, I'm a hoary head. You know, hoary there, of course, is re referring to a white or a gray head. Somebody, you know, I don't know anything about that, by the way, but, but, you know, when, you, when a person gets on and hears their, their hair turns white, that's what it's referring to. And, you know, that, that your hair just turning white does not automatically mean that you're necessarily uh, somebody that has a great wealth of wisdom. You know, it's what's inside your head that's going to determine whether or not you have any wisdom to share. And I've had, I've had people in the past, men that were older, try to throw uh, Leviticus 19 at me. And I, of course, you know, very respectfully countered with Proverbs chapter 16 actually it wasn't even me it was another pastor I didn't want to get into that whole situation but a guy felt like I was uh, being disrespectful to him and uh, but the thing was that you know this he was a he was an old roommate of mine he was somebody I kind of helped out and, and things kind of gone sideways in our relationship because of that and he just wanted me to just you know let him slide because he was older my pastor had to, had to bring up six, Proverbs 16 and say hey look you know I know you're older here but it's if it be found in the way of righteousness you know and it's it's uh and would to God we saw more of that in our churches, that we saw more older men that, you know, the gray head that had wisdom and knowledge and understanding and experience in churches that we could go to and to treat them. And unfortunately, uh, we've even gotten to a place today where a lot of uh, the generation that's gone before us, they, they're not found in the way of righteousness. They've got the gray head, they've got the hoary head down, but they've kind of let things slip in a lot of ways. Right. Not saying that they aren't out there. Of course they are, and I'm sure there's churches that have plenty of them, but it, we should strive to be that person one day. You know, it, that's something to strive for as well. That one day you can live your life in such a way that you will be that hoary head. Amen. That one day you will be the, the old gray-haired man and you will have the wisdom to be able to give to other people. But don't think just because you got older that you automatically have become wise. You know, that's something you have to learn from. There's that saying, there's no fool like an old fool, right? Because right? you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You know, it, it, at least the young fool, there's, a, there's hope for him. Usually when people get set on in their ways and they're much older, you know, then they, that sometimes often it's too late to correct them because they're just so set in their ways uh, and, they, and they don't want to receive any correction because they just feel like, well, I'm older, I, I know more than you automatically. So this is showing us, first of all, that, you know, we should be treating our elders as fathers. It says they're the elder women as mothers. These are people that we should be going to for advice, uh, giving, giving ear to what they have to share with us. Uh, the younger as sisters, uh, the younger men as brethren, and, and with all purity. And it says there in verse 3, and this is kind of where it gets into, spends quite a few verses dealing with the subject of widows. And it says there, honor widows that are widows indeed. So we see here that there's, there are widows, and then there are widows indeed. So... It, and it shows us that, you know, there's two different types. Uh, and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's one particular one that we are to honor, and there's one that is not honor. Now, what it's talking about honor, as we'll see here in a minute, is talking about supporting financially. You know, uh, not th you know, that the church may be charged, as we'll see here in a minute. But it's talking about the church that would take, because remember, this is Paul writing to Timothy. He's saying, like, look, as a church, you need to honor widows that are in widows indeed. So if there is a widow, and we're going to look at these qualifications here that meets these qualifications, that they are then, uh, can be taken into the church and supported by the church financially. But I'll say this, it's a rare case. Because we'll see here, in beginning in verse 4, that widows are uh, widows indeed if they are truly desolate, or destitute, excuse me, if they're truly destitute, which today is highly unlikely. You don't see, I don't think you see a lot of that. In fact, you see a lot of uh, widows today that are financially independent. Right. 
that are well off, that are secure, that they, they don't need the help. So today, this is probably a lot less likely, but back then when they didn't have things like social security and not everybody, people were you know, living off of what they grew out of the ground or whatever, you know, things weren't as financially secure, um, this would have made a lot more sense. It still makes sense today, and probably in s you know, some parts of the world, this would probably be much more applicable, but here in the United States, maybe not so much. But we'll see here that it's widows that are widows indeed are those that are truly desolate, those that really do not have an immediate support network, somebody else to fall on, somebody else to help them out. And we'll see here also in verse four that this support network that they are to rely upon extends beyond just their immediate family. Look there in verse four, it says, but if any widow have children or nephews, okay? So he's saying, look, it's fine to take her in if she's a widow indeed, but if she has children or nephews, it says there, let them first uh, learn to show piety at home and to requite their parents for that is good and acceptable before God. So we see that before a widow can be taken in the church, she, we have to ask ourselves, does she have children? And are those, chil those children, it is their responsibility for them to support their, their, their parents in their old age before the church takes them in. And it says there that they, uh, they are to learn to show piety at home first. Now who is it that's supposed to learn to show piety at home? The widow? No, the children. It says, let them learn to show pi first to show piety at home. It's the, the children of that widow that need to show piety, to show re uh, religious you know, obligations th that they're under, to fulfill those religious obligations and to, uh, as the scripture commands them, and to support their, their widowed mother. Uh, and it even extends beyond that. You'll say, well, I don't have any kids. Well, do you have any nephews? Right. Now today, this would be a very foreign concept to us. You know, I can't imagine, even for myself, it's kind of hard to think my aunt calling me on the phone and saying, hey, I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a pinch here. I need your help. But you know what? I mean, that's what it's telling us, right. you know? So that we see that God, in God's view of things, that extends even beyond um, just your immediate family, even into your extended family. So let them first of all show, show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is a good and acceptable for God. And you say, well, you know, this is old fashioned. That's kind of, uh, you know, that's not in vogue. That's gone out of style. We don't do things like that in, you know, in our modern day. This is not how we practice things. But go ahead and turn over to Mark chapter 7. Let's see what God thinks about this. About people who would just have a flippant attitude and just dismiss this. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, we need to go home and if we have an, an, a widowed mother somewhere that we need to, you know, force her to sell her, you know, ranch-style home on her 10 acres with her two-car garage and her, you know, the, the Buick that she drives twice a week to the grocery store and the pharmacy and, and come live with us because we got to fulfill this obligation. I mean, if, there's, if, there's, if they're, not, uh, they're not destitute, you know, if, they're able, if their husband left them something, they're able to support themselves, you know, great. Then we're, we're not under, um, we, you know, we're not, we don't have to fulfill this. We're, we're free from this. But let's not also not have this flippant attitude to say, well, this just doesn't apply at all. Like, what if this did happen to us? What if our parent, our mother, if a widow who was a widow indeed did come to us? And we'll see what also what makes a widow indeed here in a minute as well. There's more to it than just, you know, having lost your husband that they have to meet certain qualifications, but we shouldn't have a flippant attitude about it either. Look here in Mark chapter seven, verse nine, where Jesus said, uh, speaking to the Pharisees, it says in verse nine, and he said unto them, full well you reject the commandment of God that may keep your own tradition. So he's accusing these guys of something pretty serious, right? When they're rejecting the commandment of God in place of their own tradition so that they can do things the way that they want to do things. That's what he's calling them on the carpet over. Verse 10, he says, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, so what's he's quoting, you know, Deut Deuteronomy 20, where he's talking about, you know, the, the fifth commandment, you know, to honor thy father and thy mother, that, uh, that it may be well with thee, and that thy days may be long upon the earth. It is the first commandment with promise, as it says this, well, you know, that, that God will honor those that honor their parents. But he's saying, you guys are discounting this. You know, one of the Ten Commandments and you, but ye say in verse 11, if a man shall say to his father and mother, it is Corban. Okay, Corban, by the way, all right? C O R B A N. I don't know how many people I've had come up to me, oh, like in the Bible. I'm like, no, not in the Bible. That's my name, isn't it's your one letter off, buddy. No, and by the way, don't, ever, don't, don't yeah, whew, dodge that bullet. Thanks, mom. But, you know, don't name your kid Corban, by the way. It's not a good thing. Corbin's great, you know, it's, it's, it's taken, you know, I've got, we've already got a couple, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I've had people come, it's all like in the Bible, I'm like, no, 
But if you shall say to his father and mother, Cor it is Corban, that is to say, a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about uh, somebody who, instead of honoring their parents, as Moses commanded, going and saying, oh no, you know, instead of you giving me new inheritance, it's a gift. You, you not requiring this of me, it's as if they're giving the, their child a gift. They're saying, no, my parents are allowing me to, to go free in this. They're, 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 if that makes sense. They're saying, you know, it, it is a gift whatsoever thou might be as profited by me. You know, instead of me fulfilling this obligation that I'm under by, according to God's commandment, you know, rather we're just going to say that you're, being a, you're just a letting me go on this matter. And it says there in verse 12, And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God an effect, but through your tradition which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Now look that right there, there's a whole other sermon about the fact that we shouldn't be, you know, it's okay to have traditions as long as they are not making the word of God of none effect. And we're not teaching them as the commandments of God. But what was going on here is that they were excusing themselves and others from their God-given duties. Right? This is a God-given duty to honor your parents, to honor thy father, to honor thy mother, to, to, uh, to show piety at home and to requite your parents is a commandment of God. It's something that is commanded by God. And they're here excusing themselves saying, oh, it is Corban, it is a gift. Uh, you know, we're free in this matter. And you know, you even have parents today that, you know, they excuse their, their children from this duty. Now again, I'll say, if they don't have no need of it, then sure, I guess that makes sense, you know. Uh, this, is, this is here for a practical reason, so that God's people could, would be taken care of in their old age. This is God's retirement plan, right. right? So if a parent has no need of that, then of course that makes sense. You know, if they're already set up financially, they're taken care of, you know, if they, you know, an understanding that the help is there if it's needed, you know, th they're, they're f then that's one thing. But today, now you even have parents who say, and I've heard they say, well, I don't want to be a burden to my children in my old age, so just stick me in a nursing home. I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that. Right. To me, personally, I think that's wrong. I think a parent in their old age, you know, if they, and especially if it's a widow that meets these, uh, these qualifications, you know, and this, just, uh, this goes for parents in general. You know, if, if they get it, we should honor our mother and our, our father and our mother. It's both of them. You know, but he's talking about in 1 Timothy specifically about whether or not a widow is going to be brought into the local church and be taken care of by the church. But... Now we even have today parents that are excusing themselves and saying, well, just stick us in a nursing home. You know, we don't want to be a burden to you. But I disagree with that. And I think it's a product of a selfish culture, you know, where people just, they don't want to be bothered with mom and dad. Now, I remember my mom telling me about how when her grandmother got older, she came to live with them and then eventually passed away. Right. But she spent her last, you know, remaining years at home with the family. Now, to me, that sounds a lot nicer, you know, getting to spend my, my elder years before I depart from this world around my adult children and my grandchildren. Yeah, right. I know my mom liked it because she was my grandma's favorite, you know, and she'd sneak up to the, the apartment they had upstairs for her and she'd get candy she wasn't supposed to have, but, you know, that, that's a sweet memory that she had. Now, that she would not, a sweet memory, by the way, that's <laughs> pun intended, right? <laughs> so anyway, but what she never would have had any of that. If, if, she, if grandma had just been like, you know, just stick me in an old, old yeah, I don't want to be a burden to you. It's okay. I know you're trying to raise your family. You have busy lives. You know, just stick me in some nursing home. That's not a good way to go out. No. And I, you know, I understand this can be a touchy subject with people because this is a situation a lot of people are in. But uh, it's not one that I want for myself. You know, I wish the kids were here tonight so I could, you know, you know charge them with this. You know, I do not want to be stuck in a nursing home in his old man. And that's why, you know, I endeavor to live my life so that when I am older, I'm worthy of my children uh, honoring me in that way and, and, and to, to, to take care of me as they, as they ought to. Because when we see here in 1 Timothy 3, and this, you know, this, there is a clause here, I believe. There is a clause to where, you know, a parent is not automatically entitled to this. Um, look there again in 1 Timothy 3, where it says... Um, <coughs> Where was I there? Uh, <coughs> verse four, five, four. Yes, verse 4. And it says, But if any widow have children or nephews, let them first to show piety at home and to requite their parents. Now it says requite. And that's, I believe, where you find a clause here because that word requite, that literally means to make an appropriate return. That's to return the favor. Mm -hmm. That's a, you know, reciprocating is a, another synonym or uh, giving something in, in return. So he's not saying, you know, so I believe the clause here is that if you have some deadbeat dad who's not a part of the, f the, f the picture, 
let's say. You know, just when the kids are young, runs off, does not fulfill his duties as a father, doesn't support them, isn't there to graze the children. He doesn't just to, c to come back in his old age and say, well, I'm old now, honor your parents. Because it's a requiting. It's, there's, there's something, you know, and, and maybe, and if you could, maybe I'm wrong in this, but this is how I feel about it. I mean, this is from reading this here, where I read that word that you are to requite your parents, to repay them. Um, to me, that makes more sense than just, you know, some deadbeat gets to come up, come back years later, right. you know, and, and just say, okay, well, now it's time for you to take me in your home and support me in my old age after I've gone off and lived a life of sin. So I do believe there is a clause there. Now, you know, not everyone might agree with me on that, but that's, that's how I read it there. So <laughs> I believe that if our parents have fulfilled their duties towards us as children, if they've taken the time, you know, especially your mother, you know, <laughs> right. who, is, who went through, you know, childbirth and labor and caring you and then caring for you and the dad supporting all that and paying for that housing you sheltering you teaching you instructing you feeding you for all those years and making you into a productive healthy individual then you know it's not too much to ask for them for you to spend a, a few you know a, a few maybe a decade or whatever when they're older and they're in need help right. to repay and to requite your parents and the thing is God demands it and God honors it as well and God promises you that if you do that, you yourself will have a long life, that you yourself will be blessed with long days. So <coughs> we do see that our parents, you know, I believe are obligated to fulfill their role, but parent, our children are also for, for obligated to fulfill their role. So uh, go on there in verse 5, and now it gives some of the qualifications about widows as well. About It's not just, it's, remember, it's widows that are widows indeed. A widow who is truly desolate, who does not have the support network of children or nephews. And not only that, but she also has to have lived in her life in a certain manner. It says there in verse 5, Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplication and prayers night and day. So she's a woman of prayer. She's a woman that loves the Lord. So a widow indeed is one who is desolate. She doesn't have the support network. And she also has to have this appropriate attitude and have lived her life in a certain way. It says there in verse 6, But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and these things give in charge, that they may be blameless. It goes on and says, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worth for an in, worse than an infidel. Now we'll get into the qualifications here for the widow, but verse 8 is an important, important verse not just blow by. It says there that if a person does not support, uh, if he if he does not provide for his own, especially for those especially for those of his own house. Now I believe that's referring to his 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 children, his parents. Uh, even in this instance, we see even a godly aunt who would need the help of a nephew. If he does not do that, if he does not provide for himself for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith. Now that's a heavy charge. So, I mean, you can have all your, everything else going for you. You know, you're reading the Bible, you're going to church, you're living for the Lord. But if you miss this, you've denied all that. The Bible's saying you've denied the faith. And not only that, you're worse than an infidel, the unfaithful, right? So that's a real heavy charge, you know. So we, this is something we really ought to pay attention to and have down. God takes this seriously. And it says there in verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number, talking about being brought into the congregation, those that are cared for, uh, you know, uh, by the church, under three score years old. Now, of course, the score is 20 years, so three score is 60 years old. So one of the qualifications for a widow is that she has to be destitute, truly destitute. No children that can support her, no nephews that can support her. And not only that, she has to, been, she has to be at least 60 years old, having been the wife of one man. So now it's, you can see how it's not just every old lady who lost her husband gets to just come into the church and say, well, I'm a widow. And has that happened? Yeah. There's been ladies that just say, well, I'm a widow and the church has to support me. Okay, well, let's, let's turn to that passage and let's read that. Yeah, right. And let's go down this list. The husband of one wife. Well, you know, well, sorry. Right. You know, that's probably why, maybe that has something to do with why you're in the position that you're in. Right. You know, because you, you were switching up husbands. Yep. You know, <laughs> and you weren't, uh, you didn't give a guy a chance long enough to like you well enough to take care of you in your old age. <laughs> you know, I don't know. But, I mean, it just goes to show us that, you know, God doesn't just forget everything. You know, that he holds us accountable for our actions, even into our old age. Right. 
So he says there, uh, let not a woman taken the number of three square years old, having been the wife of one man. Okay, goes on, comma, right? Verse 10, well reported of for good works. I mean, they have to be able to, you know, we're not just going to say, okay, well, she's got these down, that's it. Now it's time to go around and ask folks, well, what does she do? What does she do with her spare time? You know, has she been a help to anybody? Has she been a blessing to anybody? Or is she just a pain in the neck and a burden? Well reported of for good works if she have brought up children. Right there. So, I mean, she has to have brought up children. You know, you say, well, if she's brought up children, obviously, then they have to be fulfilling their role. Well, maybe they're not. You know, maybe she really is destitute because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Or maybe they've died. Okay? If she have lodged strangers, going back to the idea of being hospitable. Right? So, this is somebody that would have to take folks. Now, this doesn't mean weird people. You know, it means people that are foreigners, people that are passing through. And again, we talked a little bit about this. This would have been a bigger deal back then than it is today because back then there wasn't a Motel 8 around every corner. You know, if you're traveling somewhere and you needed to get out of the street, you'd have to find somebody to take you in. And a widow, you know, well, a good work that she would have done would have been to lodge strangers to bring them into her house. And it goes on, if she have washed the saints' feet. Now that was a custom back then, you know, because when you're walking around back then, if you had these open-toed shoes and things like that, you know, your feet get dirty. It was a custom to... Go into somebody's house, one of the things they would do is to wash your feet. They'd have a basin of water and clean your feet. So that was something, you know, that's just speaking the fact whether or not she's been hospitable and opening her home and, and, and providing for others as she's able. If she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. So this has got to be a lady who's got a good reputation, who's been, uh, you know, working in the church, providing uh, others where she's able to do, lodging strangers, washing the faint saints' feet, uh, relieving the afflicted, you know, pe people are sick in the church, maybe she's the one that's showing up, and, you know, bringing a cup of soup, saying what everybody's doing, that kind of thing. Uh, she's, she's busy in the church doing the right type of things. If she have diligently followed every good work. You know, this is a lady who has a good reputation. This isn't just every, every lady who loses her husband and is 60 years old. This is, this is somebody special who's, who's earned it, quite frankly. So we see that widows, they have to qualify for support from the church. Now, do we see this often today? No, we don't. I, in fact, I've never known of a church, and maybe it happens. I don't know. Maybe I just don't know about it. But as far as I know, I don't know that Faithful Word supports any widows. I haven't, any of the churches I've ever been in have never supported any widows. Because quite frankly, you just don't see the need of it as, as much today, I don't think. But is it there? Is it something that's in the Word of God? Yeah. So is it worth understanding? Because what if this does become, this might be something that comes up right. in the future of our church. We need to understand these things. And these qualifications that we see here, quite frankly, they make this type of a widow a rarity, especially today. You know, these are, this is a, a very special person uh, who's, who's been uh, faithful for a very long time to the Lord. And it says there in verse 11, but the younger widows refuse. So if they're not 60 years old, doesn't matter, even if she meets all these other qualifications, if she hasn't met that one, refuse her. Why? For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. You know, she's going to want to get married again anyway. If she's young enough, she's not going to want to just live the rest of her life as a widow, supported by the church. She's going to wax wanton, she's meaning she's going to desire that relationship, and she's going to marry again. God already knows that's, where, that's what God wants for her. God would rather have her do that to go out and marry another man, to be another man's wife, and to raise children. It says there, uh, uh, let, uh, uh, they will marry, uh, when they begin to wax wanton, they will marry, verse 12, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. So this is probably referring to even some that would marry, go so far as to marry an unbeliever. That they're so desperate to be with uh, a, a man, to be a man's wife, that they'll even go so far as to maybe even bury an unbeliever. Now it says they're having damnation. That's not talking about the fact she's going to lose her salvation. It's talking about God's going to judge that. That God is going to condemn that. She's going to have uh, you know, condemnation, damnation. These are all synonymous words. Because they have cast off their first faith. Uh, she's cast off you know, like the first love. She's, not, you know, she's putting that individual, that, that carnal desire above God. And uh, it says there in verse 13, And with all they learn to be idle. Right? Wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also, and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. So that's the danger there. That's why they're to be refused, is because that they'll learn to be idle. You know, this is, this is, uh, this is a real warning, and this is something that, 
you know, all ladies need to pay attention to. We should, we should be very careful because we're living in a time where this, this is even possible for a, uh, it is possible for a married mother with children to even fall into these same sins because of social media today. I mean, back then, if you wanted to be a busybody, if you wanted to be a tattler, if you wanted to be going about from house to house, you had to physically get up and go to that house and open your mouth and have a conversation and start to, to do this. Nowadays, all you got to do is pull out your phone. And you can contact way more other people. You can get on one of these groups and just, oh, did you hear about so-and-so? You can direct message. You can, you know, text message. You can do email. You can, you can reach out to a lot of people. You can start your blog. And I'm not saying all those things are bad. It's what you're using them for, right? If, yeah, Facebook especially. You know, if you get out there, and you now you can be a tattler. You can be a busybody. You know, the kids are walking around with, you know, butter knives in their hair with jelly on them full diapers scribbling on the wall and mom's on the couch just the laundry's piling up dad's coming home having to cook hungry man or whatever it is you know put a put one of those pot pies in the oven that i love so much right and uh the banquets you know the banquet yeah. pot pie oh yeah we've got some midwesterners out here okay good so <laughs> But yeah, that's the thing. Like that, that's what they need to look out for. And this is possible for even a married woman today with kids to fall into this because of social media. You know, this was a problem back then. How much more so now to where it could even affect not just widows, not just young uh, unmarried women, that this could be something that we even, uh, our, our, our own wives could get involved in. We gotta, and let me, you know, and I've told my wife this. This is the rule. If I ever found out that she ever was going around being any kind of a busybody on social media, I would break her phone in front of her. And she knows I mean it. I would take that phone out of her hand and smash it in front of her right. and, and eliminate the internet. I would cut her off. You say, I can't leave you do that. Well, it's my wife, it's my house, it's my rules. Amen. And I would rather do that than have my wife to be a busybody. Now, praise God, I don't think that's ever going to be a problem. You know, but I've known people in the past, they should have had that same rule. And would to God they had that same attitude toward theirs wife. They would have spared themselves some heartache. And uh, so this is a problem. That can be, it, it, it's out there. So we need to be uh, on guard of it. And what's one of the best remedies for it to avoid this whole situation of being of a woman turning into a, a, a tattler and a busybody and, and idle and speaking things which they ought not? You know, not just nasty, dirty things, or repeating uh, bad jokes, but just talking about people in ways that they shouldn't. Just going around being a gossip, being that kind of thing. Well, verse 14 gives us the solution. I will therefore... In light of all these facts, in light of the bad, the, the potential to do something to turn out in a bad way, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now you could you just hair lift every feminist there is out there, right? I mean, this is this is the anti, this is the true feminism, by the way. This is what it means to really. I mean, I, I, this is the most womanly thing any woman could ever want to do, to bear children. I mean, it's the only. I mean. Only women can do that. <laughs> so, I mean, that's feminism for you. But that's not the culture we're living in today. They want to say, no, women should be able to go out and pursue careers. And basically, what it boils down to, they say, well, women should go out and be able to just act like a man. Yep. That's what they want to do. They want to reverse the roles. Yep. They want men to act like women, and they want women to act like men. They want to just turn everything on its head. But the Bible is very clear that God wants the younger women to marry, to bear children, and to guide the house. Why? So that they will give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You know, being married, being, bury, uh, being bearing children, guiding a house, that is a lot of work. I mean, that's 24-7, seven days a week for years. You know, there, there's, it's, you're on call as a mother any time of day. You know, those kids need you. And they need a lot of attention. They need a lot of work. And this is a full-time job. You know, you're not going to have time to get on, at least you shouldn't, you know, and I guarantee you, as a wife and mother of children, if you're getting on social media a lot, I'm not saying if you're, <laughs> my wife gets on it, it's like a treat to her. It's like her downtime, right? When the kids are in bed, she gets to catch up on Facebook or something, and she'll say, oh, did you hear about, I'm like, yeah, I heard about that days ago, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me? It's like, oh, I know you'd, you know, I didn't want to spoil it for you, you know, the, the spoiler, right? So she gets caught up on all of her, the stuff that's kind of going on out there, and and, uh, you know, has her cup of coffee. And that's how tired, you, you know you're tired when you can drink coffee at 9 o'clock at night and then go to bed an hour <laughs> later, right? But it just goes to show you it's busy work, you know? So I'm not saying, like, you should never be on it. I'm just saying you should probably have some other priorities. 
And, and there's plenty of ladies out there, they have their priorities out of whack in this area. Where they're spending too much time on that, the kids aren't the priority, the education is not the priority, dad's not the priority, it's, it's strangers. And another, it's, it's people going from house to house, being a busybody. You know, it's talking to people in some cyber world that they'll never meet in, life, in real life. They're more concerned about what's going on, right. you know, digitally than they are in reality. So we should be on guard about that. And if a woman does these things, if she marries and bears children and guides a house, she's not going to have opportunity to get involved in these things and get into this kind of trouble. Uh, you know, ideally, of course, there are exceptions and it does happen, but I mean, this is, you know, if she's doing it right, she's going to be too busy to, to, to do what it says there in verse 15, for some are turned aside already, already turned aside after Satan. You know, so that's, that's strong language. Now, do they, do they realize they're going after Satan? I'm going after Satan. No, they don't realize that. Right. You know, no, no person in the right mind is going to say, well, I'm just going to go be, I'm going to go follow Satan. That's not how he works. He's very subtle. So, you know, this whole thing about being idle, about being a bu uh, busybody, tattling, being a, ta a tail bearer, speaking things, that, that the Bible calls that going after Satan. Being a false accuser, right? These are, these are things that the Bible says are like going after Satan. And if the solution here, the remedy, is to marry, uh, the young woman marry, bear children, and guide the house. So here, and this is great advice, I mean, for people who are wondering what God's will is. You know, I think, especially when we're younger, we all go through that, well, what's God's will for my life? And especially in a lot of churches, you'll get this whole, they want to get real mystical about it. And they want to tell you, they have, have whole sermons. I remember when I went, I went through this phase you know, my late teens, early 20s, about trying to find God's will for my life, you know. And really, I know this is addressing the women, but really, it, it, it's two birds with one stone. You want to know what God's will for your life is? It's to get married and to bear children. Now, it takes two to tango, so if the young woman has to get married, that means there has to be a young man out there. Right. So that's the same. It's the same for the young man as it is for the young woman. God's will for your life is to get married. Right. And I think the sooner the people get married, the better. Amen. It keeps us out of trouble. Now, I, don't, I think we should definitely be very careful about who it is we're going to marry, but <coughs> this is God's will for our lives. It says there uh, in verse 16, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them, and let not the church be charged. So Paul is being very careful here to not say, to, 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 uh, to, make, uh, to make it clear that, yes, the church is there to support widows, that we should take care of those that, that need it. But let's not just turn it into this, you know, this charity where it's just everybody that walks to the door with the sob story all of a sudden is entitled to money. Right. And people have this attitude towards church. And it happens all the time. You know, uh, it, down at the church building once a week, someone will be knocking on one of those doors. More off, I mean, I've seen it. And you could tell by, you could, they're looking in through the little glass in the door, like, is anybody in there? Well, it's not Sunday at 1030. I mean, I don't know why you think we're here, you know, it's... But we're there working, you know, like anywhere else. The doors are locked for a reason. But we go over there. We not open the door. Can I help you? Hey, yeah, I was just wondering, you know, if you guys uh, help people out with, um, you know, bus fare. You know, they always have some story, you know, about how their car broke down. And they, you know, they were getting a money order. But their, <coughs> their sister back in Oklahoma or wherever, you know, you know is, isn't going to have the money till Monday. I mean, they'll have some elaborate stories. And they'll really try to sell you. But that, but what they, what they, they don't read, they don't read Baptist Church. They read ATM. Right. That's what they read. They, re, they read just you know money tree, right. and they just and people have this mistaken notion that a church is just there to just hand out money to people that need it. Well, one, it's illegal. You can't just give money away as a church. That's not being taxed. You know. Now the salaries of the employees are taxed. That's why I hate this stupid argument about how. How you see these dumb atheists and things like that. Oh well, you should take away their tax-free status. Well. No one's profiting from it, first of all. Right. And the people that are making a living from it are paying taxes. Right. The same taxes you're paying, you know. But that's a whole other sermon. The point I'm trying to make here is that Paul is being very careful to say, let's not be uncharitable, but let's make sure we're helping people who really need it. And not just everybody who feels like they're, they're owed something by the church. And people come into churches with this attitude. And I've seen it firsthand where people say, well, you know, I think we should just be everyone. We should all have things of one accord and, and we should all be just splitting up the offering amongst ourselves and, 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 and supply, supplying one another's needs. That's crazy. Where do you get that? You know, it's, 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 it's nuts. 
here's the thing. We should seek to unburden the church. That should be our motivation. To bear the church's burdens, not to be a burden to it. You know, we should be trying to help. You know, we should be bearing one another's burdens. Amen. You know, we should be helping one another out. Now, it's great to come to church to look for help, but maybe you should be trying to find it in the pew by getting to know somebody, de developing a relationship, having a friend, somebody that you could entreat as a brother, somebody you could entreat as a father that you could go to in a time of help, in a time of need, yeah. rather than just coming to church leaders up with your hand out in a sob story. And Paul, again, being very careful to say, let's not just write everybody off, but hey, in the case of a widow, there are some very, there are some very specific qualifications so it goes on there in verse 17. So it kind of deals with mainly with widows, but it does talk a little bit uh, here um, uh, towards the end about the elders and, and uh, them being paid as well. It says in verse 17, let the elders that rule well. So again, here we see in the same chapter where what's he referring to as an elder? He's referring to a pastor here. So again, just like in 1 Peter 5, it's being used in two different contexts. You have to read the context to get what it's referring to. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. So what we see here is that you can kind of, what I get out of this verse is that being an elder or being a pastor, that's just like an old, just being coming old is no guarantee of you being, you know, uh, having that glory. There's no guarantee in having glory as a pastor too. People should just not get in the pastor just thinking that they're going to get some kind of glory out of it. Because that's one, that's a wrong motivation. And two, there's no guarantee of that. See, some people think you get this idea that, well, if they just could just get that title, that if they just get the titer, title pastor, that that just means everybody's just going to treat them with this awe and just respect and honor. No. It, there's <laughs> you have to meet some qualifications here, too, if you want that. Let them be kind of worthy of do double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And it's work. They're doing the work of the ministry. So, really what I see here is that there's, I said three originally, but now as I read this, there's actually four tiers of elders. There's four different le levels of being an elder that I see here. One, okay, so there's the, there's the elders that rule well, right? That means there's elders that don't rule well. Right. There's elders who are just, you have elders who aren't ruling at all. Right. Just anything is going in the church house. They're the pastor, but they're run by the deacon. The, the deacon board is running them. You know, and, they, or the, and it, a lot of times those deacon boards have the ladies on them. And they're used super throwing over the man. And they're determining what color the carpet's going to be. And what kind of chairs they're going to get. And what's going to get hung up where. And, and when the flower arrangements are going to get changed. And yada, yada, yada. And all these things that go into the, these, these trivial little things that everyone wants to nitpick and rule over. You know how many people I consulted about the carpet here? Nobody. <laughs> I think I might text one person. Was it you? Maybe. I don't know. I had two options. And I was like, what do you think? I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought too. We went with green. You know how many people I asked about whether or not they wanted the gray chairs? Nobody. Right. I just got them. Right now, obviously, I'm the I'm just the deacon here, but I'm acting on the pastor's behalf in that matter. Amen. I didn't even text him. I didn't even call Pastor Anderson. Hey, what color, what kind of color uh, chairs do you want? Because he'd rather me just figure that out. You know? <laughs> He's got bigger fish to fry than the color of the chairs in Tucson, right? right? But that's a, that's the thing. Like you have elders who are not they're not even doing that. They're not ruling at all. They're not doing anything. They're just there to just fill the pulpit for 30 minutes with a little ditty to make you feel good and go home. So that's one tier, elders that aren't ruling at all. And then there's elders that rule, but are they ruling well? I mean, maybe these are the guys who are there, they're doing a good job, they have the authority, but they're not doing a very good job at it. Maybe they're, they're, maybe they're fleecing the flock, they're taking advantage of the position and, and kind of, you know, and I've seen that when people, there, now, now everybody in the church is just there to do them favors. They have them run, I've seen it where they have, them, have church members running their errands and things like that. I'm thinking, I'm glad I'm not in your church, buddy. That's not ruling well, right? And then you have elders that are ruling well. What are they, what, you know, they're, they're maintaining, what it means to rule well is to maintain order in the church, to keep it together, to keep it going in the direction that it needs to go. They're ruling well. They're not letting heresy in. They're not letting sin in. They're dealing with things. They're making sure the church is on track and is pleasing to Christ. That's the elder that rules well. Now, is every elder doing that? No. That's why he's saying, you let the elders that rule well be kind of worthy of double honor. The ones that aren't, don't let them be kind of worthy of double honor. And then you have the elders, even amongst them that are ruling well, he goes on and says there, especially they that who labor in the word of doctrine. So maybe you have a guy who's ruling well, man, he's got the church down, he's taking care of it, but is he laboring in the word and doctrine? So here's even another level, you know, of, 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 a, of an elder 
who's, who's not only doing the job, but he's also laboring in the word and doctrine. So when I read that, I see that there's several different tiers. You know, there's, there's things to attain unto even as an elder within the church. But here's the thing. People, and here's the thing. I believe this church has an elder who is worthy of double honor and is one that labors in the word, worthy, uh, labors in the word and doctrine. You know, Pastor Anderson is one of those that I would say rules well and is worthy of double honor, and he especially so because he labors in the word and doctrine. You know, we know that about him. But does that mean because Pastor Anderson, you know, you go to another church somewhere, you're some listener online maybe, and these guys that are in another state and they're going to some church that doesn't have an elder like that, that all of a sudden they can just give that guy attitude? That they can just start telling, well, that's not what Pastor Anderson does. That's not how well Pastor Anderson does things. No. You know, and one thing is, you know, Pastor Anderson, does, you know, not everyone has to do it like we do it here. That's the great thing about, I love about the way God laid out the New Testament church. He left a lot of things open. He wanted, I think he kind of wanted to see what we would come up with, right. how we would run a church service, how we would do things to honor and please him. He didn't say there's any one right way. Okay, now, of course, we know there's certain things that are allowed and certain things that aren't, but God kind of gives us liberty in that area. So we don't all have to look for this cookie-cutter, faithful word Baptist church somewhere right. in some other part of the country because you're probably not going to find it. And praise God for that. That doesn't mean the elder behind the pulpit up there isn't a one who is worthy of double honor either. I mean, if he's, if he's doing the job. But here's the problem that you have. Though. You have these guys that maybe the elder isn't one that's laboring the word of doctrine. Okay, the, the doctrine stinks. There's some doctrines that, you know, they're, they're preaching dispensationalism. You know, as, as long as they're not re preaching, you know, some damnable heresy, get over it and go to church. That's my advice to people like that. And people are always emailing and calling a church and saying, I can't find a church like you in, in our area. Well, uh, you know, and, and first things come to mind, it's like, have you even tried? Have you found, can you find a church to go to? I mean, the Bible says, you know, we, you, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. It didn't say that we should not forsake the assembling together of Faithful Word Baptist Church. You don't have to go to this church or find a church just like this church to be right with God. You can still go to a church where there's an elder that rules. And you should be thankful for that. That you should at least have that. That if you go to a church where there's a guy that's at least ruling, that is at least using a king, saying, no, we use the King James Bible here. Right. And even if he proceeds to get up and teach a pre-tribulation rapture, get over it and go to church. That's my advice to these people. At least he's ruling. At least he's got something down. At least he's got something right. And that's just a good principle in life in general, that people need to stop thinking about all the things they don't have and be grateful for the things that they do have. And if you at least have an elder that's ruling well or ruling at all, you should be grateful for that, especially this day and age. There's places in the world where you can't find any Baptist church. It's just not there. I mean, Europe, the Middle East. I mean, I, I'm probably forgetting a lot of other places. But there's parts of the world where you can't find an elder that's ruling at all. So, and then you have people in a, in a country like ours where there's a, church, a Baptist church on every other corner. In every podunk holler, there's, there's a Baptist church, practically. And, but it's not, it's not up to their, their standard. Well, I'm glad you have such a high standard. But unless you're willing to move to a church that upholds that standard, people need to learn to just shut up go to church and sit down and be the blessing that they can in that church and encourage that man of God you know encourage a guy behind the pulpit maybe he's ruling maybe you can encourage him to rule well and I'm not saying get up after the service and tell him what he needs to preach but just show up with a smile on your face and and do some soul winning right. and and praise God and just be a blessing in that church so <clears throat> what is the honor here that it's referring to those that are worthy of double honor now, I believe, obviously, it's, it's probably, it's definitely referring to the fact that they should be respected, that they should be respected even more so, if the better of a, an elder that they are, which is something that people really need to work on as well. I, I've found uh, it's amazing to me how many people have come through the doors of even Faithful Word Baptist Church and just copped an attitude and gone off, and then the next thing you know, they're online running their mouths and just saying the most wicked, blasphemous things just, just, just mean-spirited, uh, uh, untrue things about Pastor Anderson. They, then they just go on the attack against their pastor. You know, the guys that leave Pastor Jimenez's church, you know, get kicked out. Next thing you know, they're online. They have whole channels just de dedicated to attacking a man of God. You know, that's, um, you know, that's not counting them worthy of double honor at all. That's not even a quarter honor. That's zero honor. You're in the negative at that point. 
And uh, there, you know, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother sermon there. But, you know, obviously it's referring to that we should be giving these people respect. You know, that even if we disagree with them on some things, you know, they're still worthy of us treating them well and properly and, and respecting them. But it's also referring to the fact that they should be paid. You know, and this is not something I want to spend a lot of time on because there are sermon, there's going to be a sermon about this in the future that I have planned, but it's here, so we have to talk about it. It says in verse 18, for the scripture saith, so it's in the context of honoring the elder, right? Verse 18, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians 9. What he's talking about here is the fact that the pastorate is a paid position. And people will argue with that, and people... They get upset at that, and every single time... You know why people get upset at that? Because they don't want to go to church. People who don't want to go to church, what they want to do is they want to find an excuse to excuse themselves for church. Right. Because they know the Bible says you should be in church. Yep. But now, so now, they, now, to, now for them to be out of church, and in their mind to be right with God, they have to find an excuse of why they can't go to that church. And if you could say, well, you know, pastors shouldn't be paid, you've probably <coughs> just gotten rid of practically every church there is. Because it's, this isn't a complicated... This is a very surface doctrine, and most people get it, and that's why most pastors are paid. You know, it, you know now are there pastors out there that choose not to be paid? Yeah. You know, I, I had a pastor who worked full-time for a living, you know, at a very hard job. And it wasn't because, well, one, because the church, I don't think, could support him. It wasn't that big. But also part of it was is that he didn't want to even go on, on staff, even, you know, uh, some pastors choose not to, and that's fine. I think they can get more done. If they, I think if it's uh, possible for a pastor to go full-time for the church and to be supported by the church, he should. Because then he can labor in the word and doctrine as he ought to. He, he won't neglect the word of God as much. Not that he's not doing that, but he can even more so be given to it as he ought to be and feed the flock even better. But uh, the pastor is a paid position there. Look there in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 13. Uh, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? I mean, Paul, it's a question. He's like, don't you get it? <laughs> I love it when Paul asks questions. A lot of times he's doing it very sarcastically. And they which wait at the altar are partakers of the altar. I mean, he's, don't you understand the, the, how the Levitical priesthood, the Levites, the, the priests of the altar, they lived of the altar. Yep. That was how they sustained themselves, was the offerings that were brought. Verse 14, even so, in like manner, in the same way, just like then, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now he's referring to himself specifically that, you know, he because that's what he did. He went out and preached the gospel and he had that power to 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 receive of the church. But it's also talking about the fact that the pastor is a paid position. Again, I don't want to go real deep into that, one for the sake of time, and two, because that's an upcoming sermon that I'd like to preach in the future. But it's really clear there in verse 18 of 1 Timothy 3. I mean, just look at the language there. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Is it because you don't like the sound because the, the ox talks too much? You want it to stay busy working? It's just running its mouth? No, it's because they, they don't want the ox, to, to while it's treading out the corn, to lean over and eat some of the corn. But that's the, that's the picture, that's the analogy that he's using here. Is that when it comes to a, the pastor is like that ox treading out the corn, right? Making the food for, f to feed people. Don't muzzle his mouth. You know, let him eat of the corn that, that he's, he's treading out. Uh, let him, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. You know, if, if they're doing the work, if they're wor laboring the word of doctrine, not are they worthy of honor, they're worthy of double honor. It doesn't say you have to pay him double honor, but they're worthy of it. Uh, and it goes on in verse, says, in verse 19, and it's talking more about, you know, an attitude that we should have towards uh, elders. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. Now, whenever, this is a very serious sin to receive an accusation against an elder. Because an elder, a pastor who is up, it, it automatically becomes a target. And the devil will, will attack the leader before he attacks anybody else. That's who he goes after. And he has a lot of ways of doing it. And one of the ways he likes to do is to bring accusations against him. And that's why elders, people who are in this type of a position, should be careful about the, the situation they allow themselves to get into. Um, and, and so that accusations cannot be brought against them. But he's saying, look, even if an accusation is brought against an elder, it has to be before two or three witnesses. You know, probably three. If you really want to make yourself have an airtight case, you should probably, you know, two at the minimum. But three would be even better. Before you just come to make an accusation against a man of God, 
you better have your ducks in a row. You better know you're right. And people th are very flippant with this. You know, this always makes me think of Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles, uh, pastor of First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana, who's passed on to be with the Lord. Probably, like it or not, probably one of the most influential preachers in our modern history, I would say, had more impact in this country than any preacher ever has. Um, huge Sunday schools, I mean, soul winner, very impactful preacher. But there was a lot of accusations that were thrown at him. Now, some of the ones that were thrown at his son were proven to be true, but there were a lot of some wicked accusations that were thrown out, even by other pastors. I've heard other pastors of other independent Baptist churches get up and just accuse that man from on hearsay, on the account of one person. Some other guy comes from the from the from Pastor Ohio's church and tells this other pastor something, and he, and now all of a sudden he's going to get up in front of his whole congregation and just you know spill the beans on Pastor Hiles. No evidence. Just, accu just one, a one accuser, and he's just standing up and just dragging a great man of God through the mud. And you're on dangerous ground, buddy. Yeah. You, you better watch w what you're doing there. In my you know, that's what I see there. Against an elder, receive not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. You have to understand something. The elder is somebody who has a target on his back. There are going to be accusations. Somebody might even come to you and start saying, hey, did you, hear, did you know this about Brother So-and-so or Pastor So-and-so? You know what I heard? You know what I saw? You know what I think? And just bring up some accusation lightly. Or start to feel you out on how you might take an accusation. And really because they're just an enemy. They're just a Judas. They're just somebody who's crept in unawares and just wants to try and bring down a man of God. That's why you have to have two or three witnesses. You know, if somebody comes to me with an accusation against Pastor Anderson by themselves, I don't even want to hear it. Right. In fact, we're going to go to Pastor Anderson and talk about it and see what he thinks about it. You know, I'm not going to bring that up in front of the church. I'm not going to gather other people and say, well, I heard this one guy, you know, said this about pastor wh whoever, and now we're going to go confront him about it. You know, you better have evidence. You better have witnesses. Why? Because I understand, and we should all understand, that they have a target on their back, and that's why God has given this provision. That's why he's given this warning and this clause in here that you don't just receive every little thing that you hear. Because pastors that are getting up and laboring the word and doctrine and preaching the whole counsel of God, they're going to upset people. It's, they're going to rub people the wrong way, and those people are going to get vindictive. Those people are going to be vengeful. They're going to want to get back at him, and they're going to go online and start saying things. They're going to try to come into the church and, 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 and do things. It's crazy, but it happens. So we should be careful about what we say or what we hear regarding any pastor. I don't care who it is. Any pastor, um, somebody comes to you and wants to bring some kind of a railing accusation, you know, don't hear it. You, know, um, you should rebuke them sharply. You know, if they come to you and say, hey, pastor, this, you know, this and that, and if they don't have another witness or two, and they don't have some evidence, that you should. I think it's your duty to chew that person up one side and down the other. And just how dare you even think about doing that? And I would probably bring that to the pastor's attention. Hey, just so you know, so-and-so is saying this about you. And let him deal with it. Now, he's, it's so serious here. Look at verse 20. Them that sin rebuke before all that others also may fear. Now, I've heard this, people misapply this. This isn't talking about any, anybody who ever sins. We are to rebuke them before all. You know, well, it's come to our attention that brother so-and-so, you know, on Sunday nights, is, it's been going down to the bowling alley and skipping church and smoking cigarettes. You know, now we've got to call them out in front of everybody. That's not what it's talking about. <coughs> it's talking about in, in the context of verse 19. Right. Those that would bring a, an accusation against the pastor without two or three witnesses. Those that would bring an accusation against an elder without any backup, without any proof, without any evidence. Those guys that would do that need to get called on the carpet and say, hey, so-and-so is bringing a railing accusation. Bring it before the church. Where's your witnesses, buddy? Let's talk about it in front of everyone. And, and let's get it out in the open. And so why? So that one, so that person can be discredited so the pastor can clear his name and that the other people who would even think about doing such a thing would learn to fear. And to say, before I ever bring an accusation against the man of God or even think about doing it, I better make sure it's true or receive an accusation. It also ought to put fear in our hearts to even think that we would receive an accusation against the man of God without any evidence. But it's specifically referring to that sin, not just calling out everybody's you know, sins before the whole church. And now verse 21, because here's the thing, we all sin, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. We could get up, that's every church service, the entire service, we could probably get up here and just, you know, if we we're all confessing our faults and now we've got to rebuke everybody's sin, and, you know, week in and week out, and we'd be busy. We would never even get to the Word of God, right? Because we're a bunch of sinners. 
Now, verse 21, it says, I charge thee before God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the elect angels, that thou observe these things, thou preferring one another, one before another, doing nothing by partiality. So what is he saying here? You need to hold everybody to the same, accountable to the same degree. You know, if the pastor's best buddy is the one that brings an accusation, he needs to rebuke him, just like he would anybody else. If it's your own, you know, if it's, if, if it's some dear lady in the church that you've known for a long time and all of a sudden she wants to, you know, the church to support her, well, you have to, you can't prefer her above one before another. You know, you got, you got two widows in the church. This one's been, you know, you don't, you know, she doesn't, she didn't bring you uh, cookies and brownies and everything else, but this one does, you know, you can't prefer that one. Oh, she makes sweets, but she doesn't meet any of the, uh, the, the qualifications. This one, you know, gives me an ugly, uh, you know, the evil eye every now and then, but she meets all the qualifications. You know, you have to let these things, the word of God be how you determine what to do within the church. You can't prefer one another before, uh, before the other. <coughs> so you have to hold everybody accountable to the same degree. You know, no, you can't cut your buddy slack, you know, if, if he's being, you know, needs to be dealt with this, in this way. It goes in verse 22, it says, lay hands suddenly on no man, Neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep thyself pure. Now, it's not talking about, you know, laying hands on another guy, you know, getting into it. We already know that the pastor is not to be a striker. He's not to be a brawler. But what he's talking about is don't be, not being quick to ordain others. Not being, that's what he's talking about, the laying on the hands of the, pre, given, uh, of the presbyty, presbytery, which is what we saw in verse 4, right? Or uh, Chapter 4, verse 14, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the presbytery and the doctrine of the laying on of hands. And, and it's, a, it's a doctrine that we see in the Bible. That's how a person is to be ordained in the ministry. That's what he's talking about. You know, don't, don't prefer somebody above another and say, well, I know he doesn't meet all the qualifications, but, you know, I really like him. He's my buddy. So I'm just going to lay hands on him. Or don't do it quickly. You know, it's not just somebody that you know, just, just came around. You don't, it's not something that you don't have these drive-through ordinations where it's just, you know, yeah, we've known them for a few months and let's go send them to start a church. You know, you have to get to know people and see, watch them go through things before you, and they have to meet those qualifications that we talked about as well before you'll do that. So, you know, it's not, not laying hands, lay hands suddenly on no man. Don't overlook the qualifications. You don't, don't say, well, we're going to let this one slide. There's some crickets that snuck in earlier. But, but uh, <coughs> you know, not, not, not letting the qualifications slide. Well, I know it says he should have, you know, he should, he should rule his children well. But, and he's only got the one kid, but we're going we're to let that slide. No, you shouldn't show partiality. And again, as I've already mentioned, you know, I don't want to turn into a witch hunt on other people's ministries where we're going to go around and determine whether or not they should be a pastor. You know, the only pastor that you have to worry about is your own. You know, we don't have to go around trying to check everybody else's uh, qualifications out. But uh, don't overlook them when you're going to go and ordain somebody, you know, and don't turn a blind eye to sin. It says there, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. So don't turn a blind eye to, uh, to, to sin either. And look there in verse 23 where it says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine oft infirmities. Often infirmities. Some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Likewise also the good works of some are manifest beforehand, and they that otherwise cannot be hid. So I really think those last two verses there about where he's talking about how some men's sins are open beforehand, that we see them before going before the judgment, and, 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 like, and that some men's good works are open beforehand, going before the judgment, that we, we could see them before they come to light, is that it kind of ties in with, with what we've been talking about with elders and widows. You know, these are things and qualifications that you can see in a person's life. You don't have to wonder about whether or not a widow is all these things that she's supposed to be. We don't have to worry about whether or not an elder is what kind of an elder he is. It should be open beforehand. We should he's saying, look, some man's sins are open beforehand. You know, if they're not meeting these qualifications, if they're coming up short in this area, it's open beforehand. We should be able to see it. Now, some people, you know, you don't. Some men, they follow after. But I don't think what he's showing us is that it, in this case, what we see is that when it comes to widows and pastors, it's open beforehand. You know what you're getting. You know what you're dealing with. You know, uh, it's very, it's it's very open. And then, uh, and then like, and then in the same way, the good works are too. You can go to that same widow and say, "Oh, 
let's go down the list here. Oh, the, her good works are open before, and she does meet these qualifications. We don't have to wonder about these things. And uh, so I just think that's kind of, he's just kind of summarizing in the end there, saying, like, look, this isn't a mystery. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're getting it right with people because it's obvious. You know, we, uh, it's obvious to whether or not they're meeting the qualifications, what kind of, what kind of uh, 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 an elder they are, what kind of, uh, whether or not they're a widow that meets it, the qualifications or whether or not they are, wh whether they are or they aren't. But uh, so that's a, you know, a lot of practical stuff in that chapter, you know, that about how we should be uh, going about taking care of widows within the church. And really some real good application is how we ought to be with one another. You know, we ought to be treating our elders as fathers, our, the younger men as brethren, the younger as sisters. You know, it sounds like we should be treating one another like a family because really that's what we are. You know, we all have the same Heavenly Father and, you know, we are all a spiritual family and uh, we should treat each other as such. So let's go ahead and pray.